Hi, everyone. Hi, Sam. Hi, ya. Um, thanks so much to all of you for joining us at the Center for Fiction. Um, as Melanie said, it's a wonderful bookstore um, in Brooklyn, in Fort Greene. Um, I, I love to go there and I hope that all of you will get the chance to visit, um, not just virtually, but in person um, and purchase Sam's book there. Um, tonight we are here to talk about The Family Chow, um, Sam's third novel, her fourth book of fiction, um, a gorgeous, fun, um, and in some ways it felt like, I don't know, it felt like old school in like a really pleasant way. Um, and so I'm really excited to, to talk about this novel. Um, before we get into it, Sam, would you mind reading just a little bit for us? Sure, sure, thanks, yeah. I, I'll read from the beginning. Um, okay. This is part one and it's called They See Themselves. For 35 years, everyone supported Leo Chow's restaurant, introducing choosy newcomers by showing off some real Chinese food in Haven, Wisconsin, bringing children, parents, grandparents, not wanting to dine out with the Americans, not wanting to think about which fork to use. You could say the manifold tensions of life in the new country the focus on the future, tracking incremental gains and, and losses were re relieved by the fine chow. Sitting down under the dusty red lanterns, gazing at Leo's latest calendar with the limp-haired Taiwanese sylphs that Winnie hated so much, waiting for supper, everyone felt calm. In dark times, when you're feeling homesick or defeated, there is really nothing like a good steaming soup and dumplings made from scratch. Winnie and Leo Chow were serving scallion pancakes decades before you could find them outside of a home kitchen. Leo, 35 years ago, winning his first poker game against the owners of a local poultry farm, exchanged his chips for birds that Winnie transformed into the shining chestnut colored duck dishes of far off cities. Dear Winnie, Rolling out her being the homemade way, two pats of dough together with a seal of oil in between, letting them rise to a steaming bubble in the piping pan. Leo bargaining for hard to get ingredients. Winnie subbing wax beans for yard long beans, plus home growing the garlic greens, chives and hot peppers you used to never find in Haven. Their garden giving off a glorious smell. You could say the community ate its way through the Chow family's distress, not caring whether Winnie was happy, whether Big Chow was an honest man. Everyone took in food on one side of their mouths and from the other side, they extolled the parents for their son's accomplishments, heaping praise upon the three boys who grew up all bright and ambitious, who earned scholarships to good colleges, commending them for leaving the Midwest. Yet everyone was thankful when the oldest, Dago Chow returned to Haven, Dago coming home to his mother, moving into the apartment over the restaurant, working there six days a week. Dago, the most passionate cook in the family. Despite the trouble between Winnie and Big Chow, everyone assumed the business would be handed down fairly, peacefully, father to son. Now, a year after the shame, the intemperate and scandalous events that began on a winter evening in Union Station, the community defends its 35 year indifference to the Chow family's troubles by saying, no one could have believed that such good food was cooked by a bad person. Amazing, thank you. Thanks. Um, so when I, when I said old school before, I think what I was <laughs> get at is that there's like a there's like a maximalist nature to this book like it's um it's ambitious and um and roving in a way that makes that made me think of course of Russian novelists which leads me to the first question which is I know that this novel is um an homage to uh, the Brothers Karamazov. Can you talk a little bit about the influence of that book uh, and kind of what made you want to write something in response to that? 
Um, and I guess more specifically, like how one draws from um, a, another book in order to uh, write your own. Well, you know, first of all, I've never wanted to write an homage. It's never been something of any interest to me, mm -hmm. but I also am kind of an obsessive person. And at a certain point in early middle age, I got obsessed with the brothers Karamazov. It was right before I moved to Iowa City. And so I made some of my students read it with me. Um, and actually a lot of them in the last, I don't know, month have, have actually talked to me. Some of them have interviewed me, like holding the book in their hand that they read when they were in the program, which was really wild and touching. Um, you know, that they remember the book. It's an incredible wild book. and. One of the things that any person in the sort of creative writing sphere notices about Dostoevsky, but it particularly I think about this book, is that it breaks all of these rules that we were taught or that we taught in my case. You know, I mean, I I think I, I first of all, I never majored in English. You know, I didn't do the things that I think most writers do. I always wanted to be a writer, but I was busy trying to pursue like a professional path to please my parents. And so mm -hmm. when I started writing, um, I remember looking at a Bernard Malamud story and thinking, hmm, how do people end these? I like this one. You know, and mm -hmm. I couldn't, I had no language to explain like why or what he was doing. Um, I noticed, for example, that people liked a certain kind of story, that we were reading a certain kind of story in class over and over. And I assume that that's just what you did. Right. Um, at the time, everyone was doing kind of the same thing or trying to. And I just uh, ended up sort of learning that from not just my teachers, but from my classmates when I was in, in a writing program. And then, gosh, at some point, you know, just getting sick of it. Like I, I actively got tired of it. Mm -hmm. um, and so at some point, I mean, it's a long story, but I just thought, you know what, I, I'd always wanted to try to write about a character who reminded me of my dad, who was this like larger than life, like, just, I don't know, politically incorrect person. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I never saw a character like him in the things we were reading. And then I read the, the uh, Brothers Karamazov and I thought, He's the person, he's the person who has that emotional range to cover the craziness that I remember growing up with. Mm -hmm. Not crazy, like, I mean, nobody was sort of, nobody was like diagnosed. <laughs> it's right. more like we were just really loud, emotional, like dramatic, like mm -hmm. um, it, it, it felt different um, once I tried to put it on the page and not until I found um, the brothers Karamazov did, I think, okay, somebody has tried to put some of this on the page and, and having seen that, I thought, okay, uh, you know, how did he do that? And that, you know, th those kind of questions always start you off in a, in a direction. And, um, so yeah, there's, there's, it's, it's been a really great time. It was a, a great and fun experience writing the book. And partly because I felt like I was just sort of doing things I wasn't supposed to be doing basically throughout. I love that. You know, I actually, I admit I, I've never read the Brothers Karamazov. So I felt like I was coming into this at a, <laughs> at a kind of deficit. Um, but with, even without having read that book, like I, I felt like I could feel the spirit um, of something larger moving throughout your novel. It was really, really exciting to read. Um, you mentioned like, the, the pleasure of, of breaking rules. Um, and something that I remember you telling me, I, I guess this is a good point to admit to all of the attendees that I'm one of Sam's former students. Um, but I remember something that you said to our class um, was that we shouldn't write in present tense. Um, yes. Or that you, you didn't think that present tense was a great option. And what I remember specifically is that you said you felt like younger people were attracted to it because it made things feel like more immediate and faster um but that that ne wasn't necessarily the case and so imagine my surprise sam to, <laughs> to open this novel and to see that we are in the present tense 
Um, what what made that change come about for you? Was it just a feeling or? You know, I had written in the present tense before I taught your class. I wrote like a hundred pages in 2005 and it was so much fun. Mm -hmm. The thing about it was, um, I mean, and, and it was sort of an early version of this without mm -hmm. me realizing it. There was a tyrannical dad, there were three, three siblings. They weren't all boys in that particular um, draft. Uh, there was no plot. Um, but what I enjoyed a lot was just the sense of, well, I couldn't put it into words, but I can now say that it was the sense of the, an unfolding quality, which I knew was false. Like, I mean, <laughs> I've been taught repeatedly that the present tense was, you know, not good, that it wasn't real, that you couldn't actually have life unfold in that way. But right. then you read the brothers Karamazov, okay. And the first, I don't know, five or 600 pages takes place over a few days. And it's it's got this, sort of unexpected quality to it. It's surprising so that, you know, you turn the page and somebody will do or say something that you weren't expecting, or you feel like you know a character and then suddenly they'll do or say something completely that makes total sense, but that you would never have expected. And I thought, hmm, you know, it would be really fun to try doing this. Mm. It would be really, really fun. It took me a couple of years um, to gird my loins to try to write an homage to something that good. But then I just thought, okay, I'm going to try it and I'm going to try it in the present tense. Screw it. Yeah. Yeah. It totally works. And it does. I mean, I like that, um, the way that you put it, that it gives something the sense of, of unfolding. And for a book that, um, as we've talked about, like has such a big scope and is so like, um, there's, so, there's just so much happening. There's something really nice about um, that sense of like endless, endless unfolding that you feel throughout this novel that really works. So the word unfold is so interesting because it, the root of unfold is plica. I think it means to, it's the same root that's in the words to complicate and to simplify. Hmm. And so when you're writing something that moves forward and, you know, the idea of an unfolding is that you I mean, there's this really fascinating um, part about unfold in an essay by Elizabeth Bowen about writing novels, but she describes like the um, the idea of a, a dress that has been un unfold, uh, taking a dress that has been well folded out of a dress box. This is back in the 19, you know, 30s, but <laughs> the idea of not knowing what's on the next layer and then seeing the, the grand shape after it unfolds. This is the this is the fascinating thing about long novels or novels that are um, active novels, plotted novels. Right. right. Um, it's just fun. It's fun yeah. to write. Yeah. Yeah. It's fun for me anyway. Yeah. Absolutely. And you can I mean, you can feel the fun as you're reading it. It felt like the kind of novel, I don't know, I the last novel that I wrote was very like intimate and insular and everybody's depressed and not that it wasn't fun to write, but it didn't feel like as as free as this novel felt. And I, I felt as I was reading it, I just kept thinking, oh, Sam clearly enjoyed writing this. Like it yeah, just- Yeah, I did. You got, you could feel yeah. that. Yeah, my, my life was so hard, you know, cause I had so much to do that I needed something to distract me and entertain me. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I don't think I would have wanted to go to my desk because the rest of my life was full of stuff. Yeah. You know, I had family, I had all these things happening in my outer life. And then, and then the job, the job, you know, yeah. <laughs> is kind of complicated, um, time consuming. So I needed something I, that would really entertain me. And I, yeah, no, it was so much fun um, writing trying to write a book that had plot in it was fun mm -hmm. I guess is that another thing you mean by old school I think so actually yeah. which is funny because I feel like we never really talk about I don't I don't remember having teachers who like kind of talked directly about like how to do plot like everyone just kind oh. of talks around it or like, we knew it, like tacky exactly exactly and that, well, let's consider tacky to talk about to talk about it but obviously like you need you need every book like needs something that's propulsive happening it's not necessarily going to be 
like a sequence of related events. But this novel is so heavily plotted, which does take me to another question, which is like, where does it begin for you? Was it more, you know, characters? Was it the plot? Was it, um, did you move around as you wrote it? Um, did you like know a specific scene or scenario and were writing toward that? Um, yeah. So, you know, I, I, I imbibed the Brothers Kiromatsov, like I, I swallowed the book. I read it so many times and I taught it a number of times informally and once formally. Mm -hmm. And so I really, um, I really felt the book inside of me. But, you know, it's funny because I'm reading it again now after not looking at it for six or whatever many years it was while I was writing it. And I'm fascinated by well, I mean, there are things in the book that are in my book that I hadn't noticed. For example, I was really interested in these back alleys in Iowa City um, behind the houses. And then I was just reading the other day and they're talking about go, taking the back way, the back route. And I realized that, OK, you know, there is a back route in that book, too. And I forgot I was obsessed with um, mm. the alleys here and and, you know, the sort of outward facing versus the inward facing. But um, but I would say that the thing about that book is that it um, it has a let's see I mean it it has like a very basic basic idea you know somebody dies unexpectedly um, then somebody is accused and then there's a trial and mm -hmm. then so, but, but the book is interesting to me. I mean, it was obviously one of the first murder mysteries, so that's really exciting. But the, the book is interesting to me because it doesn't start with the way that things do now, like where it starts with the picture of the body, you know, but this isn't like this, this book starts by describing the conflict that led up to the things that happened. Yeah. And that made total sense to me. I mean, as a, generally as a character writer, I, um, I guess I just, uh, felt the characters moving into the story like these characters literally walked around in my brain came in started talking did whatever they were going to do um, there was very little direction from me they're not the same characters as the ones in the brothers karamazov and the setting is different and their ethnic background cultural background is very different mm -hmm. but for some reason they just they just existed it was really interesting and i think it had something to do with this idea of trying to be as open as possible too surprised like i had just gotten very sick of controlled work i felt mm. like my work was really controlled and i was tired of it mm. and i remember this it was like my first workshop my first there is a guy there was a guy in my first workshop who was kind of annoying to me <laughs> you know? but he said something to me like at some random event you know the way it is where you when you're going to school with people you run into them at like the grocery store and they tell they're talking about like somebody's work right um, but they said to me your work is i would say that the flaw of your work is that it's too controlled just randomly like people are always sort of offering this like slight aggression you know it's just like wait i didn't hear I, you know but actually <laughs> i found but sorry did this never happen to you <laughs> No, it happens. It definitely happens. Um, yeah. the, unsolicited, the unsolicited advice or yeah, yeah, for sure. Or even after, especially if you do well, I yeah. mean, yeah. you were, you were telling me something about that today and I thought about it. I, 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 you know, I think that, um, I think that, uh, so this person said this, but the fact is that a lot of times, if you can just take a deep breath and face what somebody says to you, there's a message in it, mm -hmm. you know? I don't think they were wrong. And, you know, it took me a while to just sort of say, okay, I'm going to stop trying to make everything work. Mm -hmm. And then just, let's just see what happens. Right. That's really interesting. I mean, one of the things that I was going to ask you or talk about is I, my introduction to your work, my introduction to you, I guess, was through your work. Um, my freshman year of college, Patricia Powell, the novelist assigned Hunger, um, to our class. And so I read that um, when I was 18 and I was so blown away by it. And wow. I feel like all of your books since then have been very different, but there's still um, that feeling. And I think this is something that like immigrant writers get all the time, like 
you're told like about how much your work has this sense of um, restraint is the word that's often used. Yes. Um, you're so restrained. It's so quiet. Like that kind of yes. language. And I don't know if that's like, you know, this idea that like, because we are, <laughs> you know, foreign to this country, like we feel like we need to be polite and, and kind of polished and quiet and meek. And um, again, like the thing about the family chow that I found so impressive is everyone is so boisterous. They're all loud. The characters are loud and boisterous, not at all restrained, not at all controlled, but the novel itself like embodies that feeling too. Um, so it's interesting to hear you say that. Um, Gosh, you know, it's really great to be talking to you about this because because I've been trying to explain this to people, but not everybody gets it. Yeah. Like they want it's like this lives of quiet desperation. But I mean, I felt like I had been encouraged to write sort of low key stuff by the sort of like extreme nature of the workshop as it was when I was in it. Mm -hmm. which I can't even begin to describe, but I mean, you know, no adverbs, no adjectives, no metaphor, you know, the whole thing. Right. Um, one of the, you know, one of my favorite professors told his child that he was only allowed to use two exclamation points in his entire life. <laughs> like I in know. his writing or in his, his life? All I don't his know. His entire life. I was no, it was completely, it was completely like that. And yeah. so it just kind of blended with this idea of coming to another country and then the silence that is the old country. And that is what my first book was like. Yeah. So yeah, the silence that it is the old country that cannot be discussed because it is no longer in the present and time becoming place, mm -hmm. you know, place and time. It's completely interesting and I'm still interested in it, but that was not exactly everything that happened to us. I mean, we were loud. We were, you know, I was, I say we were living lives of noisy desperation. You know, like, <laughs> right. There, right. Was a, there was verbal abuse. There was, you know, like just a lot of laughing in our house when I grew up. Mm. And it was funny because I would write these books and it's true that each of my books is different from the one before it. But one thing they have in common is they're not very funny. And some of my friends were like, well, Sam, like you can be funny. Like your work is so serious. Yeah, that's really and, funny. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, where, where can we bash away a little bit to create room for immigrants who misbehave and yeah. make jokes? Because, because, I mean, I don't know. I think some people have been made very uncomfortable by the fact that the characters do bad things. You know, yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that's a thing that ha you suddenly you're meant to like represent the entire race, the entire country. Like you, it's 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 really like a burden that I do not see put on on white writers. Like they no, almost never. never get this question ever. And I I just really admired the fact that this book completely completely threw that on its head. Like so many people behaving very badly. <laughs> and and it's fun and it's you know and it's fun and it's allowed and um yeah yeah it made me think I want more noisy desperation in my own life what you were saying about your friends saying um that you're really funny and they don't they don't see that in in the work one of my good friends in college I remember her saying one day yeah um people are gonna know you for your writing and it will be all of this like very serious stuff and no one will know how weird you are <laughs> <laughs> and so maybe one day there will be some from me like a really weird book and people will like will see that part of me too but um but that's interesting I think there are these parts that we're kind of trained or taught to hide from the work for some reason um well, there's all kinds of interesting reasons like I think about my dad he you know when he was in a strange city and he had to take a cab he would always over tip the driver because he was worried that the driver was going to think that all chinese people were cheap mm. it wasn't he who you know he was just worried about that because yeah. this is the stereotype and i'm like give it up dad stop <laughs> fighting the stereotype because they're gonna think what they think but people yeah. really do take it on themselves and they really do think if i could just behave well enough if i could just be good enough and then the question is, then what? No one will see me? Mm. Mm. Because 
because right. in order to fit into the dominant culture, you have to be invisible. I mean, you, you, they cannot see the part of you that's different. I mean, like that's not going to happen. I mean, it's, I don't know. I've been thinking about it a lot. That's really interesting. Or like, it's the assumption that like, you'll be able to also become neutral or seem as yes. though it's neutral in the way yes. that we see the whiteness is neutral. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But of course, like you'll, you'll never get there. Like, as you said, if you write the, the boisterous characters, somebody is going to complain. If you write the quiet characters, somebody is going to complain. So you might as well write the thing that you want to write. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, to talk more about the, the novel, uh, I had a question about all the food. Um, there's so much food in this novel. It made me so hungry. Um, and I was thinking about like, the, the kind of like sensory details that are that are threaded throughout was it did you always know it was going to be at a restaurant did was that like something that like informed the the writing from the beginning or no okay no I knew there was going to be a lot of food in it from the very beginning and then it made sense to put it to set it at a restaurant because it's sort of a succession drama like yeah. I don't think the original brothers Carrot Matsov is very clearly a succession drama. I mean, the older brother sort of feels like his dad owes him money, but he's basically been taking money from his dad so much to the point where he's basically just desperate for money throughout. But my character thinks that his dad owes him money, owes him a partnership in the family business. Mm -hmm. That was sort of how I translated that because, and of course the family business was a restaurant. Right. Because I was interested in writing about food and I was particularly interested in writing about the way that, um, you know, Chinese American people of my generation had to adapt their palates to the country they happen to be living in. Mm. Um, and in, in the case of my parents, it was, you know, the, the place where they ended up was the American Midwest in Wisconsin, where I was born and grew up. And the food that they came up with was really creative and interesting. Like in terms of not having ingredients that they were used to having and therefore yeah. having it. Yeah. 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 So they ended up doing things like stir frying iceberg lettuce. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 When yeah. I think about um, like different food cultures, one of, one of my mom's favorite things, I think it's like her favorite thing to do is whenever she is feeding a white person for the first time, she'll like make something very spicy and then like and then and then kind of like delightedly be like oh can you not handle this or like is this too spicy for you <laughs> <laughs> like she loves knowing whether or not people can handle the spice level of her food um and I mean there's there's not that exact thing in here but there's those moments where they're where they're like um tailoring things to the palate of their clientele and you know that it's like not exactly how they would cook for themselves or what they would cook for themselves and so Dago getting to to make the food for this Christmas party is really really like a, a beautiful opportunity for him to to kind of express himself in the kitchen in the way that he wants to. Yes, he's he's really sort of thinking about food as as feeding people as an artistic endeavor. He's a very artistic character, unlike his dad, super practical you know, super interested in money. Dago wants to express himself and to make people happy and mm -hmm. to be creative. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I'm remembering now this trip we took, we were in Paris and we ate at an Indian restaurant and the people who owned the restaurant com complained to my husband at length about how French people can't take spice. <laughs> Everything in the restaurant is therefore very bland. Oh no. I know yeah. I felt bad for them. Yeah, it's probably quite sad to, to have yeah. to, to kind of remove the thing that makes your food your food. Right, right, exactly, exactly. Yeah, I, yeah, I feel for them. Um, I wanna move on to some questions about writing and teaching. Um, as I mentioned, you were my professor when I was a student at the Iowa Writers Workshop. Um, I'm now teaching here for a short amount of time. It's my first time teaching since I was a graduate student here. Um, I'm curious to hear from you, you know, what the teaching has meant to your writing, like what it, what it allows, what it gives you. Um, yeah. You know, this is, 
this is something that it's taken me a long time to figure out, but teaching has been great for my writing. Mm -hmm. Well, specifically, it's been great for this particular book. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think I would have written it, for example, if I hadn't been talking to a student who was a Russian literature major who said, you know, the Brothers Karamazov, one of my favorite books, and I read it because of that. Mm. Um, and then I was also inspired maybe years into my time here at the workshop by a student um, who uh, was at the time writing an homage and told me that everything that he liked to write was an homage. He, he just enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. um, he was a great reader, you know, and I thought, hmm, I love this one book. Could I, should I write an homage? You know, it's it's exposing yourself to other people's thoughts is, I mean, it's very uh, nourishing. It's creatively inspiring. Um, I think I'm lucky in that I have good students. They're kind of, but I think everybody, I think, I mean, we were talking a little bit about this before, but I, I think everybody can become um, creative in some way. I mean, you practically have to like push it out of them sometimes, but you know, if you're not teaching people who want to be creative, particularly, but you're teaching a writing class, people try to trick their students into <laughs> making, you know, making use of their creative faculties. But I, I think if you're lucky to be in a place where people delight and, you know, sort of take very seriously um, the pursuit of, of literature, then, you know, you too can feel that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, it's, it's been more than that. Um, I've been inspired by more than those two things. I mean, there are parts of this book that I could never have written if I hadn't read, you know, very recent, well, I wouldn't say recent, but you know, work that's been written in the first part of the 21st century, um, as contemporary work. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know how much contemporary work I would be reading if I weren't a teacher, but I'm pretty much reading things like one or two years before they come out. Right. Do you know right. what I mean? Yeah. Like it's, it really is like feeling like you're on the pulse of like whatever's coming next. Um, and you can yes. see these little trends happening within your class. Um, before <laughs> yeah, there have been some interesting trends. <laughs> yeah, before it, before it hits like the, the wider, the wider public, which has been really fascinating. The other thing I, I realized in just this short amount of time is like um, how quickly, <laughs> I don't know how else to put this, but how quickly you can start to feel like literarily old. Um, like when you're not, when you're not around young people who were like invested in reading the contemporary literature and kind of knowing everything that's happening um, in, in the writing world right now, like it's, it's re I, at some point I had to, to stop and ask my class who they were reading now yes. because I realized that all of my touchstones, like all of the references that I was making for writers that didn't feel like it was that long ago, but like all of the writers that I was referencing were going completely over their heads. Like it, they didn't care about wow, those. Wow, I want to have a conversation <laughs> with you about who those people were because it's this is one of the most fascinating things about teaching here. Yeah. I mean, Okay, they say a literary generation is 15 years. So it's been two literary generations since I've been in this program, but I feel like there's a half generation, like maybe every seven years, mm -hmm. you know, all cells in the brain and body get replaced and all of a sudden nobody's reading whatever anymore at, at all. Yeah. It's like they never even heard of it. It's, yeah. I find it so interesting. Also, another thing that's interesting to me is how quickly, quickly work cycles in and out now. Every month, there's a new set of books that you're supposed to put on your list and read. I mean, I know this because I published a book in February and like a huge amount of the stuff is February books to read, February Indie Next list, February book of the something, you know, 10 <laughs> books, on Amazon, you know, all of it. So but then March happens, right? Yeah. And then what happens to all the February books? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like it just keeps it keeps refreshing at such a at such a quick pace that you you do have a hard time keeping up. Um, but what I meant more, more was like I don't know like for example like a, a fellow teacher here Jamel Brinkley taught a class on Edward P Jones um, and 
Uh, and Edward P. Jones is like one of my heroes. And I remember asking my class and they, all, they most of them said that they had been introduced to him in Jamel's class. By He's, Jamel. Yeah. See, that is wild to me. <laughs> how had they not read it before? Like it didn't feel like that long ago that I was a college student and they were teaching Edward P. Jones to me as a college student. So at any rate, it's just this, this feeling oh. of, of like wanting to get back on the pulse and to like know what know what the what the like next thing that's happening is that I find really, really generative about being here. It is generative, but can I also say that you can reject the pulse? Like <laughs> the pulse is setting a direction. You can sit and watch and think, oh, that's quite interesting. And I know that in three years they'll be moving on to something else. That's true. I I don't know. It, it feels to me like it's moving faster right now than it did before. Mm -hmm. I and mean, it couldn't just be me getting old. You know, when you get older, time is faster and faster. But I actually think it is actually moving faster. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what to think about it. I don't know what that is going to be. What I want to know is, I'm curious to know what everyone's going to be reading 50, 100 years from now from our era. What will they be reading? Yeah. My guess is it'll be something we're not expecting now. Well, yeah, there's that. Yes. I think part of it too is like what what is being taught? Like what are they what are they getting in the classroom? Because I feel like that's the kind of thing where the book that you, you know, that you were taught in an English class in high school or college um, becomes that touchstone for you, that reference point for you, where you keep thinking about them years later. Um, and so you know, even as we like sometimes disparage the canon, I think those kinds of books, whatever's in the in the contemporary stream that moves into that, where people are having like a common language around these books, I think that's what's going to last. Um, so that'll I, be- I hear what you're saying, but I would have thought that that would be Edward P. Jones. I think it is. Maybe it still is. Maybe I just had like a, just an anomaly <laughs> of a moment. Like maybe three. Middlemarch, we were yeah. talking about this. Oh yeah, Jamel was teaching Middlemarch. Yeah, they're, they're taking a Middlemarch class now, but so many of them hadn't read Middlemarch, which surprised me because I read Middlemarch for the first time in, in a college class. Um, but at any rate, I, I just, I'm really curious to, um, to know and to think about like what, what everybody is reading. It makes me feel, um, I don't know. There's some like there's some new energy happening. There's, which there's really always new energy and there are always surprises. Like I won't I won't name any names, but somebody at a bookstore that I'm very familiar with um, was telling me that they had ordered like a ton of these three books for the holidays this year. They just thought because I guess it's one of these things it's in bookstore in the bookstore world where you are supposed to order like a ton of a few books that everyone will be wanting those books they ordered and I'm, apparently that did not happen this year huh that the people like the whole book whatever they they thought for example that there would be a couple of books there are a couple of books they thought everyone was going to buy and read and that did not happen oh, that's interesting so everyone was going off doing something else which i think is cool like I think it's one of the best things about readers that they that they share their work with other people that books have these lives that you know the industry or whatever it is can't predict yeah um, yeah so yeah and you can you can feel that i guess when you're teaching you can you can sense like what people are moving toward which is interesting mm, yeah that's absolutely true that's absolutely true um, but that's so interesting because i think of you as being like of course, you would know exactly what they're reading, but of course, they're like you. You were in the program a little while ago, not that long ago, but long enough. A little so off. Like I do know what they're reading. Like I, I had heard of all of the books. I had read many of the books, um, but I hadn't expected. I didn't realize how deep of an impact those books had made on them so quickly, like so soon for those to be the books that they were like wild about. Um, that so that interesting. Was interesting to me, um, and they're they're great books, and they're right. Like, and it's it's. It's been really interesting to think about. Um, um, I want to say to the audience, if you uh, haven't had a chance to put a question in the Q&A box, uh, please do so. We're going to move into that portion of the talk now. 
Um, and we'll start with um, a mutual friend of ours, Daniel Orozco, um, who was, I think, with you, Sam, my thesis advisor when I was at Iowa. Oh, um, too wild. Yeah. That's so just wild. Hi. <laughs> um, Daniel says, hello, Sam. Will you ever write short stories again? Thanks. Um, that's a really good question. I, you know, I was really inspired by your short story, Daniel. He wrote this really cool short story that someone brought to a seminar and taught. I don't know if you knew, Daniel, that that Craig Collins gave Margot that story that you read at the conference and Margot taught her entire seminar. I was there. Um, it, I, I think I would love to write short stories again. I feel like my life is, is sort of against short story writing. And the only reason is that um, I just don't get like stretches of time. And when I do have any time at all, um, I'm usually sort of recovering from a book that I've written or trying to write a book like a novel, um, only because it's like a big enough project so that I can hang on to it. It's like uh, hang out to the back of a large animal as it walks through the forest. <laughs> you know, you can get you just hold on tight and if you keep doing that you can get somewhere but with with stories um i just feel like i need more time to to keep starting and stopping it just takes so much energy mm -hmm. um so yeah i would love to do it i think about it i think about it mm. oh look somebody wants to know yeah, what there more um alina asks why we aren't saying what books it's I, I wasn't trying to keep it a secret the books that my students have been talking a lot about um include luster by raven leilani yes. which i adored um carmen maria machado's books uh both in the dream house and her body and other parties um both excellent um carmen's another workshop alum um, the Idiot by Elif Batuman came up a lot, um, which again, I really loved. I think, I think she has another book coming out soon. So um, if you're interested in that, um, I think my students are really excited about that as well. Um, yeah, so those are, some, those are some of the recent books that people seem to be incredibly inspired by um, and interested in. Um, and then to get to another question, um, I'm gonna, I hope I don't mispronounce your name, Sanjina. Um, so Sanjina, okay, she asks, well, she says, hi, Sam. And then she says, started writing funnier fiction. Did your reading taste change and how so? No, because I'd always been reading fiction that I thought was funny. I just started looking at it differently. Um, I mean, there are some, there is some really fiction that's funny. Well, for example, I mean, you can read certain stories by Deborah Eisenberg are so funny that you're just like, just screaming with laughter at the funny sort of like moments in the dialogue where people sort of speak around each other. Little moments like that I've always noticed. Um, and I, I suppose that you could say, I, I actually, I, you know, I grew up reading stuff, Mark Twain, James Thurber, you know, I was always reading funny stuff, but I say that the thing that I've read, I mean, Dostoevsky is funny. This book, The Brothers Karamazov is funny. I enjoyed Patrimony by Philip Roth. This is a book about his dad, because of course, dads are a big theme in my book. Um, he had one of these larger than life dads. And there are sections of that book that I found, you know, just screamingly funny. I noticed, I noticed, started noticing how he wrote funny things. He tends to, or tended to um, escalate. You know, there wouldn't just be one joke. There would be maybe three. And at that point, you've just broken the rules of polite behavior. Once you start telling jokes that sort of pile on each other, you know that it's not gonna be the kind of book that I was brought up to write. And so I sort of enjoyed that, if that, if that makes any sense. Um, it's hard to find funny work. You know, I've, I've talked about it with um, teachers in various places, not at the workshop, but other places that students think that, that what they write should be very serious. That's one problem. And then another problem is that when you do try to write things that are funny, there's no guarantee that other people will laugh. And 
and if and people if people fail to laugh you have failed but you failed more spectacularly than people who are just sort of not trying to be funny right right like, there's something yeah. really uncool about trying to be funny and then not being funny right like in some way it feels like the stakes are higher you yeah. know yeah yeah that's interesting um thank you for the question um peter uh asks well also says hi sam and then asks would you or would be super curious to hear what sorts of trends you see happening in current generation of workshop fiction, as well as previous micro generations. Oh my goodness, micro generations. <laughs> I mean, it was a period when, um, you know, it's interesting. It has to do with who they're reading. When I started teaching, I don't remember who everyone was reading because I was so shell shocked, but I remember a period when people were reading David Foster Wallace. Do you remember this? Yeah. A lot of it. Mm -hmm. And it was shortly after his death. It wasn't, it wasn't right around, well, maybe around his death. Then I remember people were reading um, Dennis Johnson, a ton of Dennis Johnson, then a ton. Then there was sort of a interesting Kazuo Ishiguro. There was a lot of Kazuo Ishiguro, mm -hmm. um, Zadie Smith. Uh, I mean, I just, let's see, other micro, micro, I don't know. It, there are also periods where I think that different people are obsessed with different things. The program is so big that they're kind of groups of people that don't all read the same things. Yeah. That's cool. um, last year we had some Amy Barrowdale fans in the program and mm -hmm. it was really great because we could get Amy to come and like talk to us on zoom. Like one time she zoomed us from her car. <laughs> um, but you know, it's, there, there are groups of people who just get obsessed with certain people. Yeah, um, totally. Uh, and the books that, that people talk about also, obviously like they change from year to year. I remember, um, my first year, everyone was reading uh, Bolaño. To yes! Like, everyone was obsessed yeah. with that book. Um, obsessed. Yeah. And Elena Ferrante, everybody's sort of been reading Elena Ferrante. Um, Pretty consistently. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, uh, from Ruben, who also says, hi, Sam. Hi, Ruben. How do, you, <laughs> how do you write a novel with a large cast, loving the cast in the family chow? Oh, that's interesting. I mean, I think you have to kind of relate them to the bigger picture. If you start to feel the big picture, then the roles that people have within the larger scheme sort of help define them and their characters and, you know, just details and personalities. I guess the book that has the big cast that I was taught, there are two short stories that have the big cast that I was taught by, and they were the, um, Labor Day Dinner by Alice Munro and The Things They Carried by Tim O'Brien. And both of them had different methods of sort of creating a sense of who was who. And if you just look at them, you'll you'll get it. I mean, The Dead by James Joyce is like this. I actually truly enjoyed um, the the largeness of my cast, but I will I will admit to you that I had to cut it back. Like I had too many people in it. Oh, really? Um, I, had to, I had to trim it. I really did. Yeah. Hmm. Like more characters than we saw. And was this oh a, yeah. Oh yeah. Then, but um was this like a novel that was like incredibly long and had to be yeah. cut down? Okay. Yeah, it was 500 pages long at one point. And I was embarrassed to show it to anyone because I could tell that it was sort of bloated. Mm -hmm. And I cut it down to like maybe 420 before I showed it to anybody to read. But then I, you know, I just, then I kept cutting and cutting and it ended up being about 340 pages or 30 pages in, in, in times the Roman, um, <laughs> the thing, the thing, okay. So Margot Libsey is one of my role models because she's kind of a genius at writing novels. Like yeah. I told her you could give, we, we could give Margot a fortune cookie fortune. And she could, if you gave her like, you know, I don't know, time and space, turn it into some really gorgeous novel. Yeah. Um, and the thing that she said that I found interesting, um, wait, where was I? I was talking about Margo and I got completely distracted. Uh, it's this idea of, um, oh yeah, exactly. I got the sense from talking to her that there is a point when people are writing novels often, not always, but you'll have 
too much. And once you start cutting, that's when you're reaching the end of the process. And the way I can see that is just this, this cliche that, um, that writers build the material they're sculpting. You have to build it first and then you sculpt. Once you start being able to sculpt, it means you can see what you're doing. Once you can see what you're doing, it means that you're close to the end. The thing that's really hard about writing novels is that you spent a huge amount of time not knowing what you're doing. Yeah, right. That's interesting though, that that she thinks that most novels will will have that kind of like mass of concrete and then need to be sculpted. I've I've actually never written that way. Like I've never written a lot and then had to cut well she didn't tell me that this is what i heard from a single comment she made which was when she said how's your novel how's your novel going sam and i was (laughs) like well lately i've been cutting i've been cutting a ton and she said that means you're getting close Mm. and i just when she said that like i put it together with watching you know a hundred other people write novels um that they eventually finished and realized that part of the process for some people involves cutting. Why is that? It because you're creating this material. And, you know, for me, it really has to to do with understanding what the book means. I can't always see what it means. Mm. You know, I'll be struggling away and I won't be able to see what something means for years. I'm very slow. (laughs) I hope nobody else is as slow as I am. I think maybe as a teacher, I could be there for them by setting a bad example. You know? I think you're you're totally forgiven and being slow. You have more jobs than anyone I know. <laughs> um, yeah, I think we have a have time for a, a couple more questions. So I'll ask this from Yvonne, who also says, "Hi, Sam. Um, how has writing the family child generated new lessons for your classroom?" Oh, this this is actually interesting because every summer during the writing of this book, practically every summer, I've gone to the Napa Valley Writers Conference in Napa Valley, um, where I give a craft talk every summer. And I realized just, I was giving a reading um, in the wine country a few nights ago, talking to someone from the conference. And I realized that almost all of my craft talks are related to this book. And honest to God, I had no idea that they were related to them when I did them. So. I wrote about the word unfold. I gave a talk for an hour about the word unfold. Mm -hmm. I gave a talk about pacing. I gave a talk about how to capaciousness or how to make things have scope. I gave a talk about, I don't know, you know, everything I did, like my inner life talk, like all of the things I did ended up in this book. And so I realized that, uh, I don't know, teaching again has been really generative for me and super helpful in this particular book anyway. And hopefully it'll continue to be. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> we'll see. Um, so maybe time for one more. Um, what was exciting or difficult for you in writing The Family Chow that just wouldn't have occurred to you before? I started thinking about this after you mentioned deciding to bring in more humor. OK, deciding uh, or difficult. Hi, Eliana, first. (laughs) Um, I think the hardest thing for me about writing this book, getting started was very hard. Uh, Overcoming my fear of writing something that was an homage to a, a work that I completely adored, that was great and huge and impossible. It's a very strange book. I mean, I was just reading it again, as I was saying, and the characters are really, I mean, they're, they're bigger, they're all larger than life. And I'm not sure now that I'm reading it again, that I understand them, not a lot of them. So there was, it was, it was this feeling of like, of approaching sort of a, a giant smoking meteorite that had landed, you know, in your backyard and circling it and circling it and trying to understand it or looking at it and thinking, you know, what is this thing? Um, And then just leaving it alone, like putting it away for six years and then trying to imagine a thing that was like this thing. (laughs) Does that make sense? It was, it was really, it was really fun and interesting. That's beautiful. Um, on that note, I think we've we've come to the end of our time. Um, 
Thank you again so much, Sam, for being being here in conversation with me. Thank you to the Center for Fiction. Um, again, if you if you all get a chance to go, please do visit. It's a wonderful, wonderful building, a beautiful bookstore downstairs. You can join and, and get membership to the upstairs levels. Um, yeah, this is a great evening. Thank you. Yeah, it's been such a pleasure to talk to you. And I really can't wait to see the Center for Fiction when I go to New York next. Yeah. Now that we're we can't all... wait to welcome you there. And um, well, yeah, and we'll see you again soon, yeah. Uh, thank you both, that was a great conversation. And um, thank you all for joining us. Rush to buy this book if you haven't already. Um, it's a great way to spend your time. Um, it's just a wonderful read. So thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank you.